Welcome to the First Unitarian Society of Milwaukee's online worship service. I'm Reverend Jennifer Nordstrom, and I'm honored to serve as First Church's senior minister. We welcome people of all genders, sexualities, ages, races, ethnicities, histories, and bodies. We welcome your mind, your heart, and your spirit. We welcome all you're bringing with you today and all your heart longs to set down. We'd like to pay a special welcome to guests who are joining us today. If you're visiting us for the first time or joining us from afar, why don't you say hello now in the chat and tell us where you're joining from. I welcome everyone in to our worship service by inviting you to repeat our first church mission after me. We gather to nurture the spirit, engage the mind, and inspire action. Our opening words this morning are the poem, Blessing the Body by Jan Richardson. This blessing takes one look at you and all it can say is holy. Holy hands, holy face, holy feet, holy everything in between holy even in pain, holy even when weary, in brokenness, holy in shame, holy still. Holy in delight, holy in distress, holy when being born, holy when we lay it down at the hour of our death. So, friend, open your eyes, holy eyes, for one moment, see what this blessing sees, this blessing that knows how you have been formed and knit together in wonder and love. Welcome this blessing that folds its hands in prayer when it meets you. Receive this blessing that wants to kneel in reverence before you, you who are temple, sanctuary, home for the holy in this world. Let's go now to our beloved sanctuary to light the chalice, the symbol of Unitarian Universalism. The first time I sought pastoral care at our church was in 2018. What was happening to me was my awakening to the systemic racism in my workplace. I was in middle management at a nonprofit and responsible for a small team of employees. I had hired a biracial man and I knew he had the perfect set of skills to bring our work to the next level. What I hadn't counted on was the difficulty he would encounter in our overwhelmingly white, mostly female workplace. On his first day of the job, I got two emails and one talking to about how could I please keep the meetings in my office a little more professional. He was just so loud. And did there have to be so much laughing? Over the next weeks and months, there were more complaints. No one ever talked with me about his work. And like many white people before and since, when he asked me, his manager, for help, when he closed the door behind him and started crying about how uncomfortable he felt as the only man of color in the workplace. My first response was to make excuses for the other white women in our office and to try to coach him about navigating office politics. When I talked with my boss and HR about his concerns, I was asked to start documenting all my meetings with him reminded to tell him about our free telehealth mental health provider and not let things get so emotional. I remember how sweaty my hands felt and how loud my heart was beating. The HR rep asked me what I was afraid of. I'm not sure what I said aloud, but what I thought was, I'm afraid I am part of the problem. I knew I was part of the problem, 
but I didn't know what to do about it. I sent an email asking Reverend Jennifer for pastoral care around understanding how to navigate my role as a white woman in a racist world. I realized I didn't have the tools to match my actions with my convictions when I encountered racism at work and in other aspects of my life. I remember sitting quietly with Jennifer in her warm office, the sunshine streaming in on a winter day. I told her my story about what was happening at work, but also the story of my childhood and how I really thought when I left rural Southern Missouri that I would also leave the racism behind. That those boys who pulled up to my high school with those Confederate flags in the back windows of their giant trucks would no longer be part of my life. I must have also told her about how when the Charlottesville white supremacy rally happened in 2017, I didn't want to get out of bed for two days. And I was confused about why my body was having such a strong reaction to something happening in another city. But I felt so ill, my husband had to take care of the kids all weekend. Very gently and firmly, Jennifer said something like, I wonder if this is also so hard because you're noticing that racism is part of you and also lives in your body. She recommended I read My Grandmother's Hands by author and therapist, Resma Menachem. In the book, Menachem, who is black, writes for black bodies, white bodies, and police bodies. And he offers exercises for mindfulness and body awareness that set me on a path of healing and noticing more about my physical reactions and understanding them in the larger context of how trauma around racism has been passed down through all American bodies, including mine. It also set me on a path of greater compassion for all of us who tense up around accepting the truth about how the history of racism impacts our actions. And this kind of noticing and compassion for myself and others has been the foundation of the work I continue to do. I have since read other anti-racist books, taken a version of the Unlearning Racism class at the YWCA, and I found a new employer that offers real professional development around anti-racist and anti-bias practices. I have also been able to notice a change, not always, but much more often in living up to our UU ideals and my personal convictions when I face situations personally or professionally involving racism. Peace be with me, peace be for me, peace to the right of me, peace behind me, peace to the left of me, peace above me. Peace below me, peace within, peace be with you, peace before you, peace to the right of you, peace behind you, peace to the left of you, peace above you. Peace to the left 
Yeah, Jesse's 2016 novel, Homegoing, follows eight generations of the descendants of two sisters born in the 1700s in the land of the Fanti and the Asante, the land that is now Ghana. The sisters are born of one mother, Mame, and two fathers born of a great fire, born of grief and love and life and pain. The sisters are separated, separated by village, by family, by history, and then they are separated by two different paths of survival through the evils of the slave trade. The younger sister, Essie, is captured in a village raid and sold to white men who hold her in a dungeon in a castle on the coast. The older sister, Effia, is married off to the leader of those white men, the one who owns that castle, and she walks the halls above her unknown sister's head. Essie is sent to the United States where she and her descendants are enslaved, while Effia and her descendants remain free in Ghana, though their line is haunted by fire and pain and the legacy of the slave trade. Five generations later, Effia's great, great granddaughter burns herself and her young son in an accident caused by this ancestral wounding. After it, both mother and son carry physical scars to match their family's spiritual ones. Yaw, the little boy, carries the scar on his face, and he's ashamed when people gawk and laugh at him. But the scar goes much deeper than that, and he struggles to connect throughout his entire life, struggles to trust, struggles to love. As a teenager, Yaw did fall in love once. In his shy, young love, he couldn't speak to the girl, and instead he wrote poems on leaves that he scattered on the ground where she gathered water. Eventually, Yaw's friend told the girl about his feelings, but the girl shook her head and said no. She didn't want her children to be ugly. Yaw's friend told her, you can't inherit a scar. But 30 years later, when Yaw is almost 50 and still living alone and protecting his heart, he wonders. He wonders if the girl was right and if you can inherit a scar. Can you inherit a scar? When I was a young adult working in the youth-led nuclear disarmament and environmental justice movement in New Mexico, a Tewa elder taught a group of us young people about the intergenerational trauma experienced by her tribe. Los Alamos National Labs is built on Tewa land and the Tewa people have experienced plutonium and radiation poisoning on top of the centuries long 
United States government campaign of genocide against Native Americans. The elder described intergenerational trauma to us by putting a couple of rocks in a mesh bag. She held the bag up and said, the rocks in this bag represent the grief and the trauma and the harm experienced by my ancestors seven generations ago. They carried these rocks throughout their lives and when they had children, they passed their bag to their children. Then she pulled out a second bag and she put two rocks in it, representing the pain the children had experienced in their own lives. And then she took the first bag with its two rocks and she put it inside of the second bag. She said the children were carrying their own pain as well as their parents' pain. Then she pulled out a third bag representing the lives of her ancestors five generations ago and she put two rocks in it for the pain that they had experienced in their own lives. And then she put the bag with their parents' two rocks, which itself was holding the bag of their grandparents' two rocks inside of their bag. And she kept doing this for generation after generation until she got to her own generation. She held up her bag from her own life. And she put two rocks in it of the pain that she had experienced. But then she added the bags from the seven previous generations. The elder who was standing before us and teaching us now held her bag, which contained 16 rocks. The two from her own life plus two each from her ancestors of the previous seven generations. She passed the bag around and asked each of us to hold it for a moment and to consider what we are carrying in our bags, who we are carrying in our bodies and whose rocks all of the people around us are carrying. Science has shown that we can pass down the experiences of our lives biologically through epigenetics, which changes how a gene gets expressed. In 2013, a scientific study showed that mice could pass down fear to a specific lab-generated smell for at least two generations. Researchers created fear in the original mice by shocking them every time they were exposed to this specific smell in the lab. The children and the grandchildren of the original mice reacted to that same smell with fear, despite having never been exposed to it or shocked by it in their own lives. Studies have shown that human beings can pass down traumatic stress and resilience through epigenetics as well. History is literally carried through the generations in our very bodies. This moment that we're living in, this moment here and now has arisen from the past. It has been made and shaped by the past. Our very bodies were shaped by and hold and express the past. In process theology, every moment, every occasion arises as a consequence of all the previous moments in history feeding into and creating the current moment we're in. 
we have arisen in this moment in time, products of all that is and all that ever has been created by and shaped by all that has been and holding it within us, within our very flesh. The ancestors who brought us here to this moment were infinitely many things. They were strong, resilient survivors and they were cruel, selfish oppressors. They were people of God and people of this earth. They were beautiful, creative artists and furious, egotistical destroyers. They were the wretched of the earth and the rulers of the world. We came here from multitudes and we contain multitudes. Our multiplicity has moved through supremacy systems, has been shaped by and has shaped systems like white supremacy and capitalism and pa patriarchy. We inherited these systems and we carry our ancestors' experience with them in our bodies as well as our own experience with them. In the novel, Homegoing, the mother of the little boy with the scar, her name was Akua, but the villagers called her crazy woman because of the accident with the fire when she burned down her hut. She had been sleeping and dreaming of the fire woman who haunted her family line when she had that, that accident, the fire woman who had been passed down through the generations since Essia and Effia were born of Mame and a great fire. Akua lived for decades with the name Crazy Woman until 40 years after the accident, her son, finally came home to visit her with forgiveness. Her son, Yah, the little boy who carried the scar on his face, the man now who taught his students that history is storytelling, finally came home to hear his mother's story and the story of the fire and the firewoman and the pain in their family line. In his 50s now, Yah finally heard the story, not just of that instant that he acquired the scar, but of the family legacy that led to it. When his mother then knelt at his feet and begged him for his forgiveness for what she had done, Yah's closed heart finally opened up and floods of tears poured out. Mother and son wept together and Yah was released from his cage of anger and isolation and opened up to love. He finally married and had his first and only child, Marjorie. Marjorie. Marjorie is the eighth generation of Mame's descendants, and she brings healing with her life. She doesn't know her grandmother as crazy woman or a bringer of fire and pain. She knows her as home. Marjorie was born in Ghana, but her family moved to Alabama when she was young, and every year, when Marjorie visits her grandmother in Ghana, Grandma Akua takes Marjorie to the sea and tells her the story of her family. Marjorie learns about the ancestors' voices in the water. She learns her family's history with fire, and she learns unconditional love. Marjorie learns how to come home. She becomes the writer in the family, puts pen to paper to tell the story of who they are and whose they are and how 
they have become. We inherit so much from our ancestors. We inherit their ideas and their resilience and their wisdom. We inherit their cruelty and their pain and their trauma. Most importantly though, we inherit their love. We are here today because people loved one another and loved us into this moment. We have ancestors, both familial and chosen, who were complicit with evil and ancestors, both familial and chosen who resisted it. We have fire women in our stories, pain that sears through generations and we have beacons in our lineage calling us home through the storm to shore. Who is the fire woman in your line? What does she want from you? Who is your beacon? Who calls you home? Who calls you to shore in the storm? My great grandmother's name was Ethel. She was a source of unconditional love for my dad and aunt while they were growing up. My dad and aunt's parents were shaped by the Depression and World War II, and though they loved their children, they were stoic. Some of you might know a little bit about that. My dad got more demonstrable affection than his older sister because he was seriously ill as a child, and his parents learned how to say, I love you, to the son they thought was dying. My aunt struggled more to know and trust her parents' love, but both my dad and my aunt remember their grandmother as a consistent safe harbor, a source of unconditional love. She was where my aunt learned unconditional love and she was where my father learned joy. She was able to provide an easier, less complicated love to her grandchildren, a love that has been passed down to me and my sister and my cousins, the pearl of great price. The pearls of love passed down through the generation come in the same bag as those rocks. Both resilience and trauma are passed through our bodies. It's all jumbled together and even siblings of the same family don't have the same experience. Sometimes the same person can be the source of fire for one child, but the source of water for another. We all contain multitudes. Each of us is the product of the love of thousands of people and behind each of us lay thousands of broken relationships, broken promises, broken bodies, and broken hearts. The villains and the heroes of history depends on who is telling the story and when. Our lineage contains multitudes, fire women and water bringers, authors and alcoholics, abolitionists and slave owners, people who were enslaved and people who were free. Through this doorway, the doorway of honoring the love and the pain in the lineage through recognizing the complexity of our true human inheritance, our complicity and our resistance to systems of oppression, our ground thumping celebrations and our heart breaking traumas through honoring the whole history held here in our bodies lies not only compassion, but salvation. Moving through this doorway 
allows us each to be human, neither fully good nor fully bad, allows us to make mistakes and not be rejected from the sphere of love because we know mistakes are part of every line everywhere. They are part of the human story. Evil and love are part of the human story. Moving through this doorway offers us greater possibility to repair harm and to return to right relationship because it can help us release shame. The shame of being bad hinders accountability because it shuts people down and motivates defensiveness. If, however, all people are human, all have done good things and bad things in the shadow of these supremacy systems, then there's more possibility for accountability and repair when someone has done something bad because it removes the existential polarity between good and evil and the possibility that having done this bad thing means you're a bad person and now outside the circle of human love. We can all do bad things. Indeed, we have all done bad things. The work now is to own and repair them and to use our growth and our learning to dismantle the supremacy systems that have caused so much harm throughout the human family. We will honor our ancestors most beautifully by healing them, by owning all that has been passed down to us in those bags, the strength and the pain, the love and the harm. My work in this life relates to all I have inherited from my ancestors. Your work relates to all you have inherited from yours. Our work together will honor our collective ancestors by healing the big wounds making their way through our people. May we take the rocks out of the bags one by one and return them to the earth. There is no easy love, no uncomplicated lineage that comes without baggage, for we are all born of humans. We must grapple with the cruelty in our lineage as well as live in to the strengths. We must heal backwards in order to heal Forward. We must heal the wounds of our line in order to heal ourselves and our children. We must heal our bodies in order to heal our souls and have a hope of passing water to Marjorie instead of fire. I'll try to take a few rocks out of my bag in this lifetime and the bag of my people and add a few pearls, but inevitably I will put a few rocks in and I will pass them down. I pray my descendants have the strength to remove some rocks for me and add a few more pearls for their children. They will honor me in this way. Thinking of them doing this work for me as I am doing it for my own ancestors gives me hope again for that eschatological horizon of a future for humanity with less evil and more love. May it be so and amen. Our closing words today are the poem Remember by our Native American poet laureate, Joy Harjo. Remember the sky that you were born under, 
know each of the stars' stories. Remember the moon, know who she is. Remember the sun's birth at dawn, that is the strongest point of time. Remember sundown and the giving away tonight. Remember your birth, how your mother struggled to give you form and breath. You are evidence of her life and her mother's and hers. Remember your father. He is your life also. Remember the earth whose skin you are. Red earth, black earth, yellow earth, white earth, brown earth. We are earth. Remember the plants, trees, animal life, who all have their tribes, their families, their histories to talk to them, listen to them. They are alive poems. Remember the wind, remember her voice. She knows the origin of the universe. Remember you are all people and all people are you. Remember you are this universe and this universe is you. Remember all is in motion, is growing, is you. Remember language comes from this. Remember the dance language is that life is. Remember. We are going, heaven knows where we are going, we know within, and we will get there, heaven knows how we will get there.